1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, and we left off at verse 12. So we're going to read that verse again and then go on through the remainder of the chapter and part of chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now concerning the things wherever ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. For I would, I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And as we study your word again tonight, I pray the Spirit of God would teach us that we be grounded in thus saith the Lord. That, Lord, we would not only learn it for those who are adults here, but we would learn that these very truths should be taught to our teenagers and to our young children before they ever come to an age where this would become an issue. God, please deal with us tonight, and we'll thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's review a little bit the things that we have learned. The author of the book of 1 Corinthians is who? Paul. And written about what year? A.D. 55. And written from where? And written to who? The Church of God. And the theme of the book is what? Unity. And the key verse is found in chapter 1 and verse what? 10. So let's all find it and we'll read it out loud together, young and old alike. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, is that God's desire for the local church? It is, isn't it? Now, when it comes to the passage that we're reading tonight, that we're studying tonight, we're all to speak the same thing. We're all to have the same judgment. If he means what he says here. So if we don't have the same judgment, speak the same things as he clearly states here in the word of God, then we are the ones in the wrong. We should all be speaking the same thing that God speaks. We are not of the groups that try to explain away the word of God, but simply believe what it says and obey it. 
Now, in our outline of the book, the first nine verses of chapter 1 is the what? The introduction. And then beginning in chapter 1 and verse 10 and on through chapter 4, he deals with the first major problem, and that was the problem of what? Division. And then in chapter 5, he deals with another problem in the church, and that was the problem with what? Immorality. And then he gets to chapter 6, and we find that the next problem he has to deal with is those that aired problems before the lost. Now, is that the way I did it in the Wednesday evening service? What did you write down? Did anybody write it down last week? Airing problems before the lost. Is that right? What did we say? Uh, before unbelievers. Okay. All right. Let me write down unbelievers. I want to be consistent. I like being consistent. Unbelievers. Okay. Very good. Now, by the way, although they didn't have the internet back then, that same problem, uh, it would be meant and understood very carefully what we talk about on the internet, on the world wide web, where unbelievers can see it as well as believers. You'll give an account to God for the things you put on there when you go to airing problems between the saints before unbelievers. And now we get to the passage tonight, beginning in verses 13 and 14. We deal with the problem of avoiding immorality. He's already let us know that it's wrong. So this last problem we're dealing with, or the next problem that we're dealing with is what? Avoiding immorality. It's important that we get that. Now, you remember in the first problem, he dealt with this matter of division. First, he states the case. This is something that he had got word of from one of the members of the church at Corinth. And he knew it was the truth. And matter of fact, that person didn't say, now I'm going to tell you something, Paul, but you can't tell who told you. As a matter of fact, he told who told him. Uh, he put it out there. If you can't stick your name to it, then keep your mouth shut. Amen and amen. All right, there are a lot of gossips that want to just spread stuff. But you can't tell anybody where you got it. If that's the case, then I don't even want to hear it to begin with. All right, you own it if you've got something to say. So anyway, so he deals with the problem of immorality. He says in the, or with uh, division, he says a few things. For instance, back in chapter 3, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, does that sound like these people were spiritual? No, they weren't. He says, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that they thought they would be able to bear meat? Yes, they did. But they weren't able to bear it. He goes on in verse 3. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So we find him rebuking these people for uh, what they were in this matter of division. We get over to chapter 5, and he says it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles. And then he says about this in verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. So Paul tells them that he is already judged already. Verse 6, he says, Your glorying is not good. And then he gets down to verse... Um, Oh, let's see, I should have read, I'm uh, skipping a verse. Let me go back here and catch the right verse. Well, we get over to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, he gets pretty belligerent with them. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? And then he says in verse 2, do you not know, do you not know that saints shall judge the world? Verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels? He says in verse 5, I speak to your shame. He goes on to say in verse 8, Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brother. And then he says again in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He gets down to verse 15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? He gets down, verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? He goes down to verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, you're not, and you're not your own? You see, this is a continuing and an escalating rebuke. These were things these people should have known. Paul had been with them for 18 months. I doubt he is sharing new truth with them. 
These are things they should know. There's a lot going on in what's called Bible-believing churches today that the people should know better than what they're allowing. Things going on in our homes that the people should know better than what they're allowing in their homes. Shame on us. It's because we're not what we're supposed to be. There's a lot more carnality than there is spirituality going on. We find a passage we don't like so much and we do our best to try to explain it away. But understand this. When the Apostle Paul wrote these letters to the different churches, he expected the people sitting in the pew to understand what he was writing. They knew who he was writing about. And they knew what he was saying. And they were expected to get it and say the same thing about it that he's saying about it. These people were being rebuked, and they were being rebuked quite strongly. When we get to the change in subject matter here, you'll notice in verse 12, he says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He was dealing with something in the first part of this chapter that was lawful. He's not talking about lawful according uh, to the scripture. He's talking about it was lawful, just like we have a lot of very wicked things that are legal and lawful in the United States. It's lawful in the United States for a woman to have an abortion. It's lawful, but it's not right. It's still sin. And people are going to face judgment for it. Just because something is lawful doesn't mean that it's all right for us to follow it. Remember that in Nebuchadnezzar's time that it was lawful for people to uh, fall down and worship before his image when any musical instrument took place. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't do it. Evidently, the other Jews did it. It was lawful, but it wasn't right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood it wasn't right. We need to understand just because something's legal doesn't make it all right. A lot of wickedness that goes on today, and Christians hide behind this thing of lawful. He says, all things are not expedient. Now, when I was lost, I understood that there were things you would never expect a Christian to do. When I was lost. As a matter of fact, if I found out somebody uh, pretended or at least uh, professed that they were a Christian and cursed or told dirty jokes or drank alcohol... uh, Even though I was a lost man, I would have been shocked at that because I knew Christians weren't supposed to do those type of things. Today, Christians think they can just do anything and it's all right because it's lawful. It's not lawful. Fornication may be lawful, but it's not expedient and it's not right. And he says, and I will not be brought under the power of any. Now then he, in making his transition, he goes on to say... Uh, Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now stop right here. When it comes to eating, you understand you have to eat to live. Do you get that? You have to eat to live. The physical relationship between a man and a woman, as wonderful as it is, is God set it up and he set it up only for marriage and it's only wonderful in marriage. It is wicked and vile and vulgar outside of marriage. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but adulterers and whoremongers God will judge. Let me just say where you do have to eat to live. You don't have to commit fornication to live. You don't have to have physical relations with the the opposite sex to live. The meat for the belly and the belly for meats. But you see, there are a lot of things we don't have to do. What we've done is we've either taken the alphabet and we've given alphabetic names to bad behavior. Therefore, it's not our fault. We can't help it. Yes, we can help it. Or we'll say this is an addiction and somehow that makes it okay. An addiction that is sinful is still sinful. I don't care what name you put on it. 
How, even you have to pay $150 an hour to get a psychologist to tell you it's okay. He's a liar or she's a liar, either one, and it's still sin. You need to get that. Now, he's getting in to this subject about fornication and trying to protect believers uh, to avoid immorality. Notice, he says again, Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, keep that term body very important. He goes on and says, And God hath raised up the Lord, hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Here's a statement. I have all the power that I need in Christ to do right. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Don't say, but preacher, I just can't help it. I have such strong urgings in that way. Stop it. And quit lying to yourself. You don't have to commit immorality. It is a choice. If you love Jesus enough, you won't do it. The old man has been crucified with Christ. Amen. Understand that. And according to that, we are not under the power of the flesh to where we have to commit these sins. doesn't have to be done. Now, your body is a member of Christ. He makes an interesting picture over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. The scripture says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many, but nevertheless it's still one body. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 5, going back just a couple of pages here, Romans chapter 12 and verse 5, he makes this statement. He says, So we, being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. In Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, he says to the believers there, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that, he should, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You do have a choice. You can make the choice to not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. You are expected to make the right choice. Teenagers can do it. Single young people can do it. Middle-aged adults can do it. Uh, senior adults can do it. If you're saved, you belong to Christ and your body. Matter of fact, just skip down just a little bit. For he says, for instance, in verse, uh, verse 20, For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? Bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. To make, to commit fornication is to make Christ one with a harlot. To commit fornication is to make, here's how God looks at it. You say, well, I don't see it as being that bad. I don't care how you see it. You're going to face God one day and you're not going to argue with him about it. I'll guarantee you, your mouth will be clapped shut. This is how God, the Holy Spirit of God, looks at it, you better get it and understand, understand it. Now the question then comes, what is a harlot? Because it's the definition of the terms that makes all the difference in what you're saying. One of the things that we have learned here in these last 15 years from the left is they're trying to control language and the definition of languages. And so you can say a word that's a perfectly legitimate and good word, but if they're trying to push an agenda, for instance, of racism, they're going to say that's racist. Now you can't use that word anymore for that because it's racist. They've even told us now if we say all lives matter, we're racist. That's what they've told us. So what do you have? you got a bunch of people saying we, we don't say it anymore because we don't want them to call us racist. 
We're scared to death. We're letting them define the words. All lives do matter. Matter of fact, to Christ, all souls matter. It, what doesn't matter is what the color of your skin is. Oh, that's racist, preacher. Aren't you afraid you're saying that over the Internet? That's, it's not racist, number one. Don't let them define the terms and define the words because they're a bunch of hypocritical racists themselves. It's what they are. So how do we define the term harlot? Here's a, here's, here's a harlot. A harlot is physically, sexually promiscuous. That's what she is. In other words, she does not keep things under control. Uh, she does not save herself for the one that she marries. But whoever she feels an affection toward, or what she might even call a love toward, she is just wide open for any physical contact whatsoever. That is a harlot. And it doesn't make any difference how big of a house she lives in. As a matter of fact, Hollywood is full of harlots that live in gigantic houses. Do you understand that? It is also not limited by age. She can be 12 years old. She could be 15 years old. She could be 30 years old. She could be 50 years old. She could be 60 years old and still be a harlot. She could come from a lost home or she could come from a Christian home. She could be a member of an independent Baptist church. But if she is promiscuous, she is a harlot. Now that's the term. You see, again... What people want to do is they want to change the terms. They don't want to call abortion murder. We know it's murder. It's the taking of a life, a human. It's not like cutting off a mole or anything like that. It is a human life, and it is murder whether they like it or not. One preacher got up this a few years ago now, and he said abortion is murder, and any doctor that that does abortions is a murderer. He had an abortion doctor sue him for $4.9 million. And so that when they came to the preacher and asked him, what about that? And he said, well, I don't know why she didn't sue me for $5 million and get it all. I mean, truth is still truth. So don't play with the terms. The Bible says... Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Not how you take it, but how he meant it. His word, he gives the definition for his words, and that is enough. So any female that is loose with her body is a harlot. Boy, preacher, you say, that's, I, I don't agree with that. Well, you're wrong. I mean, you're wrong. I mean, you you take any other definition for the word harlot and you don't have a clue. You don't, you just wipe the whole word out. It means nothing. Oh, but she only does that when she's in love. Nonsense. I don't care how much you love someone. Fornication is still fornication. And God's promise is still true. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. According to verse 18... He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication, now underline this, sinneth against his own body. Now, all other sins, according to what he says in verse 18, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Hmm. So then drinking a Coca-Cola is not a sin against the body. I don't drink Coca-Colas, by the way. I had to give that up. The only time I drink, and that's not entirely true. The only time I don't drink, uh, that I do drink Coca-Colas is when I'm in a foreign country. I figure that's the safest thing. Nothing can live in a Coca-Cola. Isn't that right? And I do get thirsty. But all kinds of little creepy crawlies live in just regular water that don't have our filtration systems. But anyway, uh, eating white sugar. Or white flour, something cooked with white flour. Uh, You say, well, that can hurt your body. It might, but it's not a sin against the body. I'm to eat everything with thanksgiving. You understand that? You say, well, look at you. Look how fat you are. Not as fat as some people. And until you show me the scale in the Bible that says you reach a certain fatness, 
you're in sin, well then, buddy, that's where I'm drawing the line and I'll be five pounds under it. <laughs> amen and amen. Until he does that, I'm not worried about it. Do you get it? Don't you know gluttony is a sin? Well, I'll tell you what, you don't have to be a glutton to put on weight. There's all kinds of ways to put on weight without being a glutton. So where do you get that? You know what gluttony even is? Most of these people it, talk about you being a glutton if you're a few pounds overweight or 20 pounds or 30 pounds overweight. Uh, that these are people, they don't have a clue what gluttony is. Gluttony, you go all, all the way back to Bible times, and gluttony was they would go to these parties and they would gorge themselves with food. Then they would go outside, either in the street or in the trough, and they would throw it up to go back in and eat some more. That was gluttony. Being overweight is not gluttony. Just fat. By the way, if that's a bad thing, the Bible says they that trust in the Lord shall be made fat. I'm just saying, I believe the book. <laughs> show me where being fat is sin. Just show me where it's sin. As a matter of fact, I found this. I used to eat a five-piece chicken dinner at KFC. I love KFC. Original recipe. Love it. Still love the taste of it today. But today, I can only eat a one-piece chicken dinner. And I'll gain weight and be, I'll be totally stuffed after one piece of chicken. Come on, how many of you old people know exactly what I'm talking about? Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Yeah, why is it? It's not fair, is it? Now that I can afford more, I can't eat it. <laughs> so it is a sin against the body. I didn't mean to get off on that, but I couldn't help myself. Notice verse 19. Now he just talked again about fornication. He says, flee fornication. Get away from it. Then he says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So who does this belong to? Uh, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost indwells every believer. Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse, uh, verse uh, 9, if any man have not the Holy Spirit, he's none of his. Every born-again believer has the Holy Spirit of God living in here. Now, it's interesting that he uses the word temple. What do you do at the temple? Worship. This body is for worship. And it's for worship of him. Guess what? The Jews had all kinds of Stringent rules laid down for how they were to act at the temple of God. Well, I've got the temple of God right here. I better be careful what I do with this body that he's going to tell us in the next verse belongs to him. For he says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, keep your hand here. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I am being as modest as what I can because I embarrass easily. So I'm not going into great deal about these things. If you don't get it, men, you can ask me about it later. When ladies are not present, and ladies, you can't ask me about it at all. Go to my wife. Ask her. And she tells you to ask me, then you're just out of luck. <laughs> he says in verse 2, For you know what commandments we gave, uh, we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Good night, if you know the Lord, this shouldn't be that hard to you. Shouldn't be that hard for you to get. He's saying we need to know how to possess our vessels. By the way, that doesn't begin in understanding from the pulpit 
supposed to be taught at home. Dad, you got boys, you need to teach your boys about this long before they ever become a teenager. That's your responsibility. And ladies, you have got a responsibility to teach your daughters long before they become a teenager. They need to understand what God expects, what God requires. The shame is so many parents, they give up the right to teach them. They let the public schools teach them in sex education class. And then they wonder. By the way, about this sex education class in the schools, but you realize before they ever had a sex education curriculum in schools, people were having babies and doing just fine. I mean, they were doing just fine. And the truth is, most people were a whole lot more, more moral than what they are today. But you see, we teach kids how to read and expect them to do what? Read. We teach kids how to do math and we expect them to do math. We teach kids all kinds of things and we expect them to do it, and yet we think we're going to teach them sex education and expect that they're not going to do that. Well, the public schools gave up on that a long time ago. So now they give all kinds of contraceptives and everything else to kids without even telling the parents in public schools. What wickedness. Truth is, we've given away over our children to a godless society. Of course, we go beyond that because we pipe that stuff into our homes as well, and that's an added problem. Notice God's protection then from this temptation of fornication. Chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Stop just a moment, parentheses. Once you understand, every word of the Bible is inspired by God. Every word. However, the chapter divisions are not. The verse divisions are not. Normally, when they put in, man did, man, they didn't even have chapter divisions and verse divisions until after almost a thousand years of having their Bibles. And people were able to read their Bible and do quite well. Now, when they put them in, you'll find that most of the time, especially with the chapter divisions, they tried to divide it between one thought and another. In other words, all right, this finishes this argument. Now we go over to the next argument. But in chapter 7, he's not starting a new argument. As a matter of fact, he has just laid the, ground, the foundation for what he's going to say uh, in all of chapter 7. So he begins... What we see is chapter 7 now is now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. Huh. He's covered the awfulness of fornication. He says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. This, by the way, is not a command for a man to have a wife. And I'm going to show that to you here in just a moment as we get just a few verses down. It's not a command that every wife have a husband. It's not a command. But to avoid fornication, it's good for a man, a woman, to have a spouse. Uh, what about before that? They're not to touch. Touch. Now, I know I've read, I've read some of these commentaries that try to explain the way the Word of God, just like you have. I read one that said, well, you got to understand the touch here means to touch, touch somebody sexually. Really? And where do you get that out of that word? You go to the Greek language. The same word that's translated touch right here is translated of the woman who said that she sought that she might touch the hem of his garment and touching was made perfectly whole. Was she trying to touch Jesus sexually? Well, of course not. What, how blasphemous would that be? That'd be terrible. No, it just means touch. All right? Just touch. Not to do it. Now, that's how you avoid fornication. You don't have to worry about when to stop. You don't start. Do you get it? He stops it before the start. Well, that takes care of it. That'll keep you safe. You say, but preacher, you don't understand the urges that I have. He says, all right, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. That is God's protection. Now, by the way, is this difficult to understand? It's not. It's plain as can be. Well, preacher, that's you. I just don't believe it. Listen, your problem's not with me. Your problem's with the Holy Spirit of God. He's the one that put it in here. 
Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. This is God's book. This is God's will. How in the world can you get away from that? This is God's protection right here for the single man and the single woman. He said, well, how in the world can you date if you don't touch? Who says you need to go on a date? But I know there's courtship, there's dating, and everybody's got a different definition for both those. Let me just say, whatever it is, you're not to touch. Plain as that. Now, don't get stupid on me. I mean, don't get stupid. Don't come. Well, preacher, what if we're, we're walking toward the house and she trips over the curb? And as she trips over the curb, she falls down and hits her head on the, uh, on the fire hydrant that's right there. And she skinned up her knuckles and she can barely move. But I can't take her inside because I can't touch her. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> kind of stupidity is that? That's not an argument against what he's saying here. Had nothing to do with that. Good night. If you'd move your ox out of the ditch, you ought to be able to take her out. That doesn't fit right. That just doesn't go right. But <laughs> you, <laughs> I need to come up with a better uh, picture than that. But anyway, <laughs> now for the married, here's the protection. Now, men, I want you to look at this real good. I don't want you to read more into it than what's there. I want you to get it just exactly like he says it. He says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. He's talking about the physical relationship. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. Wives, you need to get it. Husbands, you need to get it. You have a physical responsibility to your mate. But just in case, I'm glad God put the next verse in here because some people try to wriggle their way out of this one. The wife hath not power of her own body. I'll guarantee you the feminists in this land do not like that verse. Because it's all about woman ought to have power of her own body. That's funny because they use that argument to kill another body. A body that they created because they went ahead and took power over her own body to do that which was wicked. And so now she's ready to commit murder. Killing an innocent body. That's amazing. But anyway, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Now, men, next part of the verse. I know you're the head of the home, but likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now, because I embarrass very easy, I have to be very careful how I, how I say this, and I want you that are adults to get it. When it comes to the physical relationship between men and women, everybody has different needs at different stages of their life, ages of their life, and so on. I think you get that. You understand it. Uh, there is not a, a certain amount of times or anything like that through your life that things are to be done because every, every family is going to be different. Here it is. Men, you don't have power of your own body. If your wife has particular needs any time during your life and this... You're to be there for. And wife, you're to be there for your husband, for his needs. That's the protection that both the husband and wife have. Forget Hollywood. Forget what Hollywood and, and our society has taught people about this stuff. Get back to God's word. You've got a responsibility to one another. Well, I'm the head of this home. Not in this year, not. You've got responsibility, meet it. You got married? All right, be the husband you're supposed to be and be the wife you're supposed to be, even in the physical part of the relationship. Remember, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. When I do marital counseling, I stay out of the bedroom in the counseling. I give one verse and that's it. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. I don't want to know what two people do. It has nothing to do with it. If your husband or wife, hey, okay. That's it. That's enough. Now, I've known preachers, you know, that in some of these so-called Christian books that have been out there, they write about the physical in marriage and all that kind of stuff with pictures and everything. I mean, they were, I know they were selling them at the Lifeway Christian bookstores, maybe one of the reasons why God took them out. I mean, could be. But I know preachers that would recommend that stuff to people who are engaged to one another. Why? 
I tell you, long before the first book was printed, people were doing fine. And if we're supposed to be so educated, we ought to be able to still do fine, even without the books. I never gave one of those books out to anybody. Never! Get married, it'll be fun just working it out. And that's the way God intended for it to be done. Boy, I really sound like a religious kook, don't I? Not to the believers. To believers, this is just what God says. And that ought to be enough for all of us. So he says, defraud ye not one another. Now notice, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves the fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, he's, he's letting them know here, if you're going to fast and pray, maybe you're going to fast and pray about the election, fast and pray for revival, fast and pray about something else. And so one of the things you're fasting from is the physical relationship. You consent together the time. The husband doesn't come in and say, we're not going to do anything for the next 10 days. No, no, no. You're to consent together about this. You want your fasting and prayer to be answered by God? You better be together about this. Don't you come in with your Tarzan-like attitude thinking somehow you're being godly. No, sir. You're to consent together about this. Isn't that what it says? And then when the fast is over, then you come back together again. Enough said about that. Let's move on. Now, so after saying all that about having, uh, getting married and so on, he then says... But this I speak by permission and not by commandment. Not what he just said, but what he's going to say right here. He said, I would that all men were even as myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after that manner. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it's good for a man if they abide even as I. In other words, stay unmarried. He's going to tell us later in this chapter that When you stay unmarried, then you're able to give your whole life to the Lord. But if you're married, you do have to spend a good part of your life taking care of your mate. You have responsibilities toward your mate. So then he says, "Uh, But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now he's saying, I'm not giving you a command here. I'm not saying you've got to stay unmarried. I'm not giving you that command. He says, I think you would be better off to be able to serve the Lord. But here's a Bible principle that God gives him. It's better to marry than to burn. The Bible says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. That's good. All right, so that's fine. He's not speaking against marriage. But he's also not saying there's something wrong with you if you stay unmarried. I mean, in our society, you wonder today, don't you? In our society. But our society has gotten so far away from this book in so many areas. This instruction is so clear. Take it for exactly how God said it. He knows what he's doing. Fornication is a wicked, wicked sin. You go through the many different lists of sins in the New Testament. Fornication and adultery are two that are always right up there near the top. Always. It is a great problem. It's been a great problem for a long time. However, in Christ, there should be victory. But now it shouldn't start when you leave the home. Man, mom and dad ought to be teaching this stuff before they ever, ever get to where they're starting like boys and girls. You know one of the sad parts about our society to me? is Girls have to grow up too fast and boys do too. You know, as a young person growing up, as a lost young person up in Sturgis, Michigan, you know, as a young boy, the only thing I was concerned about was whether or not it'd be dry enough for us to play baseball the next day. And in the wintertime, football. That's all we were concerned about. Girls didn't exist. They all had cooties. How many know what I'm talking about? Only guys. That's a shame. Yeah, okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah, boys had cooties, exactly. (laughs) Oh, my stars. Corinth was a wicked city. 
at the temples to their goddess, there were 1,000, 1,000 religious prostitutes. The Corinthians had been brought up in that all of their life. It was a main part of their whole city, the temple. Everybody, not just in Corinth, but in all surrounding areas, knew exactly what it was all about. As a matter of fact, if you called somebody a Corinthian, you were insulting them as much as anyone could be insulted. It was a term of somebody who was so licentious and wicked in their morals. Well, God forbid that it should ever be said of any of us that that's how we live. We're redeemed. We're to live like it. We're to act like it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, as I read this passage, in light of everything that he just covered in chapter 5, and then again in chapter 6, I mean, you would think this would be so obvious, and Christians would read it's easy to understand. He doesn't have to use the really big words to get it through to us. He's very, very plain. So Lord, may we not only teach righteousness... But may we be righteous in our walk to glorify our God. There are things that ought not be once named among the believers. So dear dear God, deal with our hearts. Help us to take a stand on your word, I pray, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet with heads bowed. God may be dealing with your heart about some things, or maybe like we had some young ladies the other night make some decisions about purity and right. There may be some others that want to make decisions like that, want to be obedient to the Lord. That's fine. You can do that during this invitation. But Lord, you deal with our hearts, and may we respond accordingly. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.